This is Voices of Customer Experience, a podcast where we bring you the very best thought leaders and practitioners of customer experience and its overlapping verticals, such as marketing, analytics, behavior economics, journey mapping, and design. Our goal is to help you be better at your job by listening to the experiences and leadership of others who, like you, have dedicated their careers to improving the dialogue between companies and customers. Marcus Cunha is a professor of marketing and director of the Master of Marketing Research Program at UGA, Terry College of Business. The Master of Marketing Research Program at UGA is the first and most successful program of its nature and has been around since 1981. Its alum is highly sought after and has a 100% employment rate. Before joining University of Georgia, Professor Cunha taught at the University of Washington and the University of Florida. He holds a PhD in marketing and consumer behavior from the University of Florida. Professor, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for the invitation. It would be a pleasure to speak to your audience. Awesome. Well, can we start off with you telling our audience a little bit about your career and what you've done and how you finally ended up leading the Master's of Marketing Research at the Terry College of Business over at UGA? I'm sure when your audience uh, listens to me, they're going to be guessing that I'm from Alabama or Mississippi. (laughs) But I'm actually originally from Brazil. Brazil, I began my undergrad and my master's in Brazil. And when I was getting my master's, uh, one of my professors came back from his PhD in Europe. He brought a marketing research software that's very popular in Europe, not so much in the U.S., called Sphinx. And he invited me to join him in the effort to distribute that software. And we were very successful at doing that. And I also did a lot of training for corporations that uh, acquired the, the software. At the same time as, as I was doing my master's, I became interested in a career in academia. So I decided to uh, sell my equity in the company. And I came to the United States where I got my PhD in consumer behavior and consumer psychology in the marketing department at the University of Florida. When I graduated from my PhD, my first job out of school was at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle. So I was in Seattle involved with the technology industry and teaching at the University of Washington for eight years. And then in 2011, I was recruited by the University of Georgia to move to the University of Georgia and also to be involved with the Master of Marketing Research program, which given my background made me very interested in this. So tell me a little bit about the program that you have there at uh, University of Georgia. So the University of Georgia Master of Marketing Research program, uh, the MMR program, it was the first program to be established of this nature to be established in the United States. The reason why the program was established was because of the needs of the industry. Mm-hmm. So the program was founded in 1979 and was endowed by the Coca-Cola company and other companies such as Nielsen and Mark because these companies started to realize that data was becoming widely available through uh, scanners, but they didn't have the skills to analyze that data. So based on that, along with the academia, uh, the marketing department, and professionals in the industry, the the first curriculum of the MMR program was designed. It was designed to serve the needs of the industry. Right. And and these corporate partners that help uh, found this program, are they still involved in the program today? Yeah. So, for example, uh, Mark Research is part of our board. Coca-Cola Company is also part of our advisory board, and they also have uh, endowed the program. So we have the program run, runs based on endowment from the Coca-Cola Company. Um, and your interest specifically, Professor, um, on, your, on your bio, it talks about how you're interested in learning, memory, processing, perception, pricing, and branding, right? Mm-hmm. Are those also some of the things that the program focuses around? So those interests are based on my like academic research, and we bring some of these to uh, the program. So, for example, uh, we teach students about behavior economics and the impact that it has in terms of research and marketing decision making. So um, we bring elements of judgment and decision making, but more from an applied perspective rather than from an academic perspective. Well, so the program has been around for 40 years. Is that it? Yes. Is it still the market leader in, for this segment? Is it still the best? You know, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So we are considered the gold standard uh, of the industry 
not only because you're the first founded, but also because of the training that our students go through. On, on a research, uh, recent research report by the Green Book, it showed that our program was mentioned three times as often as all the other programs combined. Wow. So we're very top of mind. You know, and one of the reasons is because of the quality of the training and the quality of the students that we bring from the program, uh, which we, and we have like a placement rate of 100% of our students. Most students receive multiple offers. Uh, this just past class, class of 2018, the entire class was placed two weeks before graduation. Wow. That's amazing. Tell me a little bit about the program. How long is it? Okay, so it's an 11 month program. So we start early in the summer in June and graduate in May. So the students are trained both in terms of methods, statistical methods, research methods, but also they are trained to be consultants. Uh, they not only learn how to analyze the data, but how to make that analysis something actionable in terms of insight. So they are, they're trained also to develop consulting skills. We also have a very, it's a very experiential learning process because the students participate in corporate projects. So it's a year long project that's sponsored by one of the companies that are connected to the program uh, where they act as if they were research suppliers and solve a research problem for this company. We also have a speaker series where we bring about 24 leaders from the industry to speak to our students so they can stay uh, you know, up to par in terms of what's going on with the, the industry. That's great. What are the requirements to enter? Because I mean, you know, this, this seems like a topic that would interest most of our listeners who are involved in this industry. So if in, in case someone is interested, what are the requirements? And so we try to attract students from a broad perspective. So we, for example, just to give them an idea, the current class has students for students that have a background in psychology, uh, have students background in sociology, statistics, uh, civil engineering, in addition to students with business uh, background. We also try to recruit nationally. So we also have this class. We have students from California, from Massachusetts, from Florida, from Tennessee, from uh, South Carolina. We believe this diversity is very important for the students to learn. In terms of requirements, is the standard grad school requirements, such as you need to take an entrance test, uh, such as GMAT or GRE. You need to have a good GPA. Uh, we prefer students that have not tried to avoid uh, quantitative courses because the program is highly quantitative. And uh, of course, it, if you have relevant experience in terms of research, that's also a plus. And how about people who are working with customer experience? Do you get any candidates who've got their hands deep into customer experience programs? You know, we try to attract students from this nature and we get some of the students, not only in terms of customer experience, but usability experience, which is very important in the technology industry because that also help us to place students in these industries. So for example, we have students that uh, graduated from our program that are currently at Google, PayPal, Facebook, LinkedIn, Dropbox, which are industries that for which the customer experience and usability experience are very important. Absolutely. Imagine being able to pinpoint precisely why your customer chose you over your competition or the other way around. How much easier would it be to create growth strategies, secure budget funding, and improve customer experiences? This is what Worthix can deliver through its auto-adaptive AI survey. Stop focusing on what and when and understand why your customers buy at worthix.com. Have you seen, like, we know that customer experience is a new industry and that it kind of branched off a little bit from market research, a little bit from marketing. It, you know, it came from all over the place, but it has become extremely important inside corporations. And we've seen a lot of interest around this field. Is this something that you've noticed happening in market research as well, where there's been a renewed interest in this uh, aspect of the market? Yeah, I think there's even conference now, like, you know, like in terms of consumer experience, people refer to CX and UX. Market research, we see now the MRX. You know, it's, it's very hard for people to fill out surveys that are super long and not meaningful. 
right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we joke that like um, you know some surveys are so long that you you have to ask the respondents age at the beginning and at the end of the survey. <laughs> they might have age in between. <laughs> So this is, it's, it's a very important area and uh, it's growing because we need to uh, collect data as with a high level of quality, but also we do not need to create a cost for the response. Right. So we can collect the data in a way that's unobtrusive to the participant and you still get high quality to understand why people are acting the way they are. Right. Absolutely. Now, now let me ask you something. Have you noticed, since this is something that, you know, you've dedicated your life to, you know, helping people, you know, become proficient in this field, what is your impression or your opinion about companies who are kind of just winging it or more or less, you know, doing it themselves and they don't really have a qualified person or a qualified professional backing up their market research efforts? Yeah, that's a, that's an issue in the industry uh, is because we have so many tools nowadays, such as Qualtrics, SurveyMonkey, and AYPM, that everybody can become a marketing researcher. However, the quality of this research is often very, very low. So because people have no idea about sampling, don't understand the biases and the errors, measurement errors that involve in survey. So we are giving access, but people need to have the training to properly use these tools. No, I absolutely agree with you. I was at a market research conference a couple of weeks ago in New York City, and it was all about do-it-yourself. And one thing that I noticed was that even with all the do-it-yourself programs that are out there, practitioners don't feel comfortable using those do-it-yourself methodologies when they have to actually defend numbers to their board or make strategic decisions. So like, you know, the overall takeaway that I had from that conference is that do-it-yourself is great for internal programs, maybe even for like marketing efforts and pushes, et cetera. But when it comes to actually making strategic decisions that are going to change the course of a business or numbers that you have to defend either with your board or the C-suite, people still resort to, you know, the institutes and to vendors and people who are qualified enough to use a scientific method to actually prove those numbers. Yeah, because those decisions are very expensive, right? Right, absolutely. And, and nobody wants to you know, be responsible or be accountable for uh, those mistakes happening on, on their watch, right? Yeah, exactly. Another, another trend that I see that sometimes people perceive that, um, at least us as researchers perceive as a black box, is the trend of automation. A lot of automation is happening not only in marketing, but also in marketing uh, research. But a lot of these automated tools, they're black boxes. We don't really know the algorithms running those uh, processes, right? right. Uh, and a lot of times they're proprietary. Nobody wants to share that. So what we see is this black box where you have an, an input of something and you have an output, but we don't really know what happened during the automation process. Yeah, absolutely. And how about unstructured data? This is something that you know people talk about all the time that there's unstructured data all over the internet, especially with reviews and uh, you know, chat bots and social media. And there are companies that are mining this data. How reliable is that to actually you know, try to retrieve voice of customer feedback and, and create statistics upon? I, I think those methods by themselves, they might not be that useful because we know there's when people are posting things, there are selection biases, right? Right. People that are very displeased or very pleased with something will have the incentive to, uh, to write something about. It. However, if you can combine this unstructured data with structured data, okay, where you have information about a person, and you can match the research data about that person and do what, what's called a data fusion and fuse the data from these reliable sources with these more unstructured sources, then I think you have a, a great level of richness. You can cross-validate this data. You're actually using you know, correct methods to collect the data, but then you're backing it up with this unstructured data, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing happens in terms of um, new technologies such as EEG and eye tracking, these uh, biometrics and implicit tests. I talk to many leaders in the industry and the feedback that I get is that those methods, they, are, they tend to be more expensive. They're becoming more affordable. 
but they still like they are used combined with more traditional research methods to increase a layer of richness uh, in the data that companies are collecting. Well, this could be a, a, a new trend in market research. What are some other trends that you've been seeing, you know, from your perspective and your angle? You know, which ones are, are, are the ones that fascinate you the most? I think uh, one thing that we, we've seen recently is this idea of um, artificial intelligence and also big data and how perhaps we can combine that. So you can see there is like a proliferation of business analytics programs, which are different from masters of marketing research programs. Those are mostly focused on people that learn how to code to extract from massive data sets some relationships between brands. So the key difference between a master of marketing research and a business analytics is that the master of marketing research, they're more about the whys and the hows rather than just identifying the relationship. It's very good to, to learn from large data set that there is such a relationship, but it's very important to understand why. So I think uh, big data and artificial intelligence are two big trends that will uh, help us to become better marketing researchers. And how about like, or looking farther into the future to things that might at the moment still be considered far-fetched, mm -hmm. but at, you know, the speed of change that we have nowadays, it might be right around the corner, like, you know, um, augmented reality or virtual reality. Do you see that applied somehow to market research? Yeah, that's what I was going to mention that um, virtual reality and augmented reality are things that are going to uh, make a big difference. They're still to some extent expensive but it can create entire retail setting in virtual reality and see how introduce your product among others on a shelf, for example, and see people how, how people react to your packaging. And also conduct experiments within virtual reality and see how small changes to your product or your message could actually lead to an increasing likelihood to buy the product. And could this be a way to cheapen qualitative research? I think this is more on the side of Capturing actual behavior. Like like focus group stuff? For focus groups? Yeah. Yeah, I think like what you see in these areas, um, you see a lot of um, on, online, you know, focus groups, resources. But I, I can see how you could perhaps use combining virtual reality with uh, artificial intelligence, create a virtual focus group where the person who's being interviewed believes that they are interacting with other people. but the conversation is being driven by artificial intelligence. Right. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated by this stuff. Another stuff that we're another thing that we're hearing a lot about is uh, like facial recognition when it comes to voice of customer surveys. So some way of uh, recording expressions and you know features and uh, eye movement and stuff like that while customers are giving feedback. What do you think of that? Yeah, so this uh, technique is called facial coding. So it was actually developed by psychologists. They studied what kind of muscles move depending on the type of emotion that you're feeling. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it, you know, on average, it takes about 100 hours to train somebody to do facial coding. But now with technology, you can do that through a computer, having just having a webcam. And while people see or watch, for example, an advertisement, the system is coding the facial expressions. And then you can see like whether at some point, for example, during an advertisement, you generate disgust or generate happiness. So facial coding is, is another thing. The automated systems are not as good yet as a human code, but they are getting much, much closer. Did you know that surveys don't actually have to be annoying in order to gather insight? Quit pestering your customers with old, bulky surveys that are hard to answer and hard to process. Welcome to the future of surveys. Simple, short, adaptive, meaningful. Learn more at worthix.com. What do you do to keep the MRR pro program constantly fresh? Because things change so quickly. From the beginning of the program to the end, some crucial stuff might have changed. So how do you stay in tune with what's going on? And how are you able to apply these changes to the program? I think we do this mainly through two ways. So, so we have a steady coursework, which basically we, we want to train people to think as researchers, right? 
we we cannot train everybody on every single tool that's out there because six months from now the tools might not you know be useful anymore. What we train people is how to think about how to identify tools that will help to solve the problem. In order to keep things fresh, we have an advisory board that has uh, about like 30 companies uh, who are part of this advisory board. And the, we always get input from the companies in terms of curriculum. So just last year, we did, we did a curriculum review, which was led by a committee of our board, board members. And so they review our curriculum, they survey the industry, and we made change to our, our curriculum based on that. Uh, in addition to our speaker series, where we bring speakers to talk about to our students about current trends, like we brought uh, Guy to talk about AI to uh, our students. Right. Uh, we also have what we call immersion days, where professionals or companies come on campus and they spend like four or five hours with students training them in some uh, new technology that's emerging and that we observe as something that is not just a fad that's going to appear six months from now. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of minutes ago, when, when Professor Cunha mentioned Guy, he was talking about Guilherme Serqueira, which is a Worthix CEO, who was at UGA a couple of months ago speaking at one of these events, right? Yes, that's correct. So he came to speak to our students uh, on the topic of uh, AI and survey, and the students were very impressed impressed with the capabilities of our Wordex. Yeah, we try to combine a bit some of these future trends with what's happening nowadays and make it accessible to companies. So it's great to hear you talking about these trends because it has a lot to do with you know the, the, the work that we put in here at Worthix. But on top of that, I think it's also really important to remind everyone that we're still talking about a field of research. So there still has to be scientific methodology. There still has to be a level of expertise involved, right? So, you know, moving back to, to what we were talking about and um, do it yourself and just having, you know, ordinary people, there, there is, is still a crucial importance of having a researcher look at your data, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. You need to, you know, you need to look at the data from the uh, scientific perspective. I'm seeing these results. What could be the problem? possible causes. And look at the sample. Was the sample uh, randomized? If not, are there selection biases? Are the reasons why we're seeing those results because of the type of sampling that we use? What are the potential alternative explanations that we have for this result? Uh, you're, if you're running an experiment or an A-B test, did you introduce possible confounds in your experiment that so you cannot tease out the real cause of the, the outcome that you're getting your results. And not many people are trained on these basic principles, but then when you provide people these powerful tools, right, they can become uh, dangerous for the business. Well, Professor, thank you so much for being on today. Before we wrap up, is there a way that people can follow your work or talk to you or somehow maybe keep track of the, the work that you're doing over in the MRR course? Yeah, so, yeah, of course, you could, um, or can provide information on how to follow us, uh, follow us on social media and also our website. Right. Perfect. Absolutely. So we'll add that to the, to the episode notes so that everyone's able to follow along. Is there, um, lastly, for, for those who maybe won't have the possibility of, of taking you know, a graduate's course at this point, is there something that you do online? Is there an online program that people can maybe sign up for? Yes, there is a, not through the um, MMR program, but the University of Georgia with the MRII, uh, they have an online certificate on uh, marketing research. And I will send you information as well on this so people can learn more uh, about it and choose the modules that they might be uh, interested in. Also on top of that, if um, for people who are already in the industry, we lead a program in November. Uh, it's called the Advanced School of Marketing Research uh, in Birkhead in Atlanta, uh, where we have a week-long program with um, professionals and faculty from the program teaching through the Ad American Marketing Association. That's wonderful. So I'll be sure to include all of those details in there. 
um, so that all of our listeners can have access to all of this information. And Professor, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate your expertise and your look on uh, market research and what it has become. Well, thanks so much. It was my pleasure. It was um, a lot of fun talking about this topic. Thank you for joining us on one more episode of Voices of Customer Experience. This podcast is hosted and produced by Mary Drummond, edited and co-produced by Nick Gomez and Steve Barry. This podcast was brought to you by Worthix. Discover your worth at worthix.com.